and welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. In December, 40,000 delegates from 195 countries will be meeting in Paris to try to forge a legally binding global agreement to keep global warming below a crucial threat threshold. Officially known as the Conference of Parties that make up the United Nations Framework on Climate Change, this will be the 21st such meeting dating back to 1995. The question is, will this global conference succeed in meeting the goal of keeping the planet from tipping into climate disaster? And if it doesn't succeed, then what? Helping us answer these questions and learn as much as we can about climate change, we're really pleased to welcome two special guests uh, to other voices. First at the far end of the table is Chris Field. Chris is the founding director of the Carnegie Science Department of Global Ecology, and he served on the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where he served as co-chair of Working Group 2 for the fifth assessment report. And we're going to be talking about that more in a, a moment, so I'll explain what all that meant. And next to him is Catherine Mock, who is senior researcher for the Carnegie Science Department of Global Econ Ecology. And Catherine also participated in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where she served as Director of Science for Working Group 2. I welcome you both to the, uh, the program. Thank you for taking your time uh, out of your busy lives to come down here and uh, help us learn what's going to be happening over the next couple of weeks. Um, before we get into the climate conference and climate change, uh, just take a moment to tell us about Carnegie Science and, in particular, your Department of Global Ecology. Sure. Uh, Carnegie Science is a more than 100-year-old investment in fundamental research for the benefit of humanity. Andrew Carnegie recognized that without dedicated support for fundamental science research, we really couldn't improve the status of, of humanity. And he uh, created a system of um, support for individual scientists and clusters of scientists around the country that's, that has more than a hundred years of accomplishments in topics that range from molecular biology to deep space cosmology. In the Department of Global Ecology, we work on big picture questions of the way the Earth system works, how people interact with the atmosphere and oceans, how ecosystems, oceans, atmosphere interact to produce outcomes that you wouldn't expect if you just studied them at the scale of the size of the table or the size of the room or even the size of California. Yeah. And what's your role there as senior researcher? I'm focusing on how do we take stock of what we know overall on climate change and how do we do better in that assessment of knowledge to create a foundation for decision making. And this is work that really builds from what we've been doing over the past five years, seven years, in Chris's case, uh -huh. with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I imagine there's quite a stockpile of, of data at this point. I mean, we've been collecting climate data for a long time and getting better all the time, right? Is that... In terms of the fundamentals of the climate problem, our understanding is vast and it's robust and it really provides a clear starting point for solutions. We have very rigorous understanding of the fact that the climate is warming, that it's due to humans, and that increasingly we see the impacts of climate changes that have already occurred on every continent. And that's something that's come along really rapidly. I think in many ways the exciting frontier of the science is also stepping into the space of solutions, recognizing that responding to climate change is really no longer a hypothetical in our world and understanding what do we do to protect people in a changing climate, what do we do to rein in our emissions of heat trapping gases? Those are some of the big questions that remain scientifically. And that's some of what the uh, upcoming conference is going to try to address each company, each country bringing their proposals. But let's start um, as a prelude to that. Um, what you, the work that you did with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, assessment report five it was, right? Right. Um, and your particular uh, working group was impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. And I wanted to talk about this because the, the panel uh, developed the science or reported the science to all these com countries to consider when they bring their proposals to the table. I was looking online and there's these summary for policymakers, and I can only hope that the policymakers yeah. have actually read them. 
But let's start there. Tell yeah, us how it, these uh, intergovernmental panels work, and more importantly, uh, what you reported to the, the world's sure. policymakers. Well, we're really fortunate in climate change science to have an institution that is broadly agreed to provide the definitive statement of what we know and what we don't know. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was found that in the late 1980s, it's kind of a partnership between the world's governments and the scientific community. You can think of it, the government said, well, you scientists, if you'll follow our rules, we'll consider your reports to be the definitive assessments. And the rules are complicated and they involve lots of rounds of of independently monitored reviews with thousands of comments. I think we had over 50,000 comments on the uh, Working Group 2 report. Each one has to be responded to independently. And then the summaries for policymakers are actually approved uh, word by word, by consensus, by every government in the world. And so the, uh, well, the, the summaries for policymakers run to some, you know, 20 to 30 pages yeah. of really succinct statements. Sometimes they say, um, warming in the climate system is unequivocal. Uh, sometimes they say there are things we don't understand. But the amazing thing about it is we have a shared understanding. Every government in the world has agreed that this is where we are with the science of climate change. It's worked amazingly well. It's worked especially amazingly well in the context of all the things that don't work on the global scene. Yeah. Uh, I, I was going to say, it's, it sounds like an achievement just to get there with scientific reports and getting that much uh, um, agreement well, from world governments. In one of these approval sessions where Catherine and I are sitting up on the stage in front of all the countries in the world, after the first hour and you haven't gotten a single word approved, you say, wow, this summary for policymakers <laughs> is going to be two lines long. Um, but what we find is that um, the science is so robust and the sense of commitment to progress is so widespread that if you work hard at it, you really can get agreement on hard-hitting, important statements that provide a foundation for the Paris conference coming up next week. Catherine, what are some of the things you would th would consider to be the most important findings or uh, ideas that you reported to the policymakers uh, of the world that coming out of this uh, intergovernmental panel? So um, that we should know about too. <laughs> um, a really big focus in the fifth assessment report, which has kind of been echoed by many other reports coming around from around the world, is that responding to climate change is very much a challenge in understanding, managing, and reducing risks. Basically, as the climate warms, we're looking at increased likelihood of severe, pervasive, some cases, irreversible outcomes. When we think about then how do we grapple with the risks, there's a scientific understanding that we want to put a limit on warming. That's a really robust way to rein in what may happen. And that something like the cumulative budget for emissions is a helpful way to wrap our head around the whole space of responses. And that essentially means that because when we emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the warming from those molecules lasts for millennia. That means that from pre-industrial times to the present, there's a certain amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases we've put into the atmosphere. And for any warming limit we pick, whether it's 2 degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius or 4 degrees Celsius, we essentially have a bucket for the carbon emissions we can put into the atmosphere since pre-industrial times. This budget concept really drives home the magnitude of the tasks and the importance of rapid action because for the budget for 2 degrees warming, we've already filled our bucket two-thirds of the way. So the question is, how do we rapidly start to put in place the technologies, the infrastructure that we need to rein in our emissions within that closing window of a budget for our carbon emissions? So the goal that's been set for the, the upcoming conference is to match that budget, basically. Is, am I understanding what you're saying about the, the budget, right, is we, we have to rein in uh, emissions to the point where we don't go over the edge of that, that budget bucket. You know, people often assume that this 2C target is some kind of a guardrail and that we're safe if we stay below it and that there's climate catastrophe if we, if we go past it. But the fact of the matter is we're already seeing impacts of the climate changes that have already yeah. occurred. And if, if you lost your home or if your business was flooded, those impacts have already been dangerous for you. So there's, there's no such thing as a guardrail that protects everyone. Uh, we know that the more the climate warms, the more impacts we'll see, and the more danger there is to the world's businesses and ecosystems and peoples. 
Mm. But we also know that the, that the risks of those impacts go up dramatically as warming continues, and that limiting warming to 2C will provide a good way to avoid uh, the worst of the impacts. It, it's not like a bright line, and if we can stabilize at 1.8, that's a lot better than 2. Uh, if we pass it by a little bit, it's way better than letting the warming go to three or four or more. So we have a budget that's associated with each level of warming. As Catherine says, the budget for a two and three chance of keeping warming below 2C is about 900 billion tons of CO2 left. That sounds like a really big number, but on an annual basis, we already release about 40 billion tons. Divide 40 into 900, and it's about 24 years of current emissions left forever. That's, that's not for the rest of this decade or the rest of this yeah. century. That, that's the total budget that humanity has for limiting warming to 2C. So if we don't do anything, just keep carrying on the way we have been at, at current levels, we've got 40 years until the system's irretrievable? Oh, well, if we... We're to continue at current emissions, which of course historically they've been growing. growing. I, I should say though, there, there's good news and there's going to be good news scattered throughout this conversation. From 2013 to 2014, the world economy grew, but for the first time that we've seen growth in the global economy, we didn't see growth in CO2 emissions. And so yeah. we're beginning to see some of the kinds of transitions with deployment of renewables and other strategies that are actually uh, pointing in the direction of our being able to get control on the problem. But uh, if emissions continue at the 2014 level for 24 years, we've used up the budget. Uh, if emissions were to grow on what we often think of as a business as usual strategy with rapid growth and industrialization around the world, we'd be looking at 2100 conditions where we had reached a warming of about twice that much, 4C, almost 8 degrees Fahrenheit, and would be blowing through it at uh, more than half a degree per decade. So the point that Catherine raises about eventually we need a vision of decreasing CO2 emissions to zero is mm -hmm. the one that people need to be focused on. Zero emissions. So we've, we've got to change energy however we get our, our energy uh, around, around the globe. I got the impression, as a layman reading some of this, that there's a little bit of debate about should the target be 1.5 degrees centigrade or 2, or is 3 okay? Was I reading that right? Is there really a debate about where the limit should be, or was I just misunderstanding something? So the current language in the international climate discussions is a goal of keeping warming under 2 degrees Celsius since pre-industrial times. There is a very extended review of that 2C target over the past few years, and indeed a lot of governments have said, well, we are already seeing impacts, as Chris described. In some places, some people would already say climate change is dangerous, and there isn't necessarily any special aspect of that 2C target. There will be impacts at 1.5C that could be yeah. unacceptable for even more people as compared to the present. As we look at increasing warming, I think an important component is the potential for non-linearities in the climate system. Basically the idea that as warming goes up gradually, we may cross some thresholds where we get big impacts. Some of the biggest ones are things like loss of biodiversity, where extinction is forever. Another big category that plays out over long time frames is the potential for very large amounts of sea level rise from loss of ice sheets. So when we think about increasing risks, there's no guardrail of protection, but we have a very good understanding that 2C is a lot better than 4C, yeah. and 1.5C is better than Even 2C. Even better, yeah. So your report was delivered to the governments of the world, I think it was March of last year, or. I think it was April. It might have been March 31st. I can't remember. Yeah, it was uh, somewhere uh, after in, many in days of negotiations. So they, they've had a year and a half to, to mull this over, and starting next week, they're going to be meeting in Paris. Um, you're going, aren't you, to the conference? Did I think Chris mentioned? Are, are you going to the yes. conference? Uh, what are your roles going to be at, at the conference? We hope that the science in our reports has already been embedded in the negotiating text. and. It, at least if we read the draft that's in progress, that seems to be the case. There's a good understanding 
of the science and of the importance of limiting the amount of warming that occurs. Uh, the concept that we need to bring emissions to zero is reflected in many of the commitments that countries have already made through these intended nationally determined contributions. And so in many ways, our, our job is there to remind people that they agreed to the science, that we know what the science is, and it's to uh, create an environment, help create an environment in which uh, people, communities, individuals, governments from around the world uh, feel that they have the support of the world community to strive for the kind of agreement that the science says they need to reach. Is there going to be a formal role for you uh, at the conference where you'll be uh, leading seminars or anything like that? Or are you just going to be working the edges and talking and <laughs> whispering in people's ears, science, science? <laughs> So in, in some ways, it might be helpful to step back and kind of look at the entirety of the negotiations process that's sure. coming to fruition right. in Paris next week. And Let's so do that, please. The, the group under the UN that is negotiating the successor to the Kyoto Protocol is, it's got a terribly long UN la name, but ADP. And it started in 2011. And they've been meeting ever since then, uh, ramping up discussions of how do we conceptualize what is a good replacement for the Kyoto Protocol. And you know, the really big advance is that it's gone from top-down pledges to bottom-up pledges. 170 governments at this point have said what they're going to do to rein in their emissions. In terms of how science has fed into this really extended process is through a very formal process called structured dialogues. And a big consideration in that was having a bunch of IPCC authors lined up giving presentations, but most importantly, leaving most of every four-hour session to questions. And a lot of those questions were, what are the impacts for small islands at 1.5 versus 2? Yeah. What are the differential impacts we could expect at 1.5 versus 2? And it was really neat, you know, from the IPCC viewpoint, usually there's um, an intensity of interaction in those approval plenaries that go through the night. But it was actually a, a flip in that all the government suddenly really wanted the answer that they could take very directly into their negotiations that were going on. So that structured dialogue process was a really important piece. It led to um, a summary document that was released a little under a year ago that basically established that we need to limit warming to 2C or less to avoid the worst of the impacts, and that importantly, 2 degrees Celsius isn't any sort of guardrail or threshold between safety and danger. Stepping forward to the present, I think you can see Paris as having two big streams, the very official negotiations process that it will be contentious and there are a lot of questions about finance, but it's important to recognize that that's a capstone of what's been going on for many years yeah. at this point. And then on the side of that, there's um, what we were calling it the psychodrama earlier today of <laughs> you know the intensity of energy around the issue that you're seeing from all sorts of business leaders, all sorts of religious leaders coming together, um, local mayors, actors from around the world, and science is a big piece in that. So in terms of the different events where IPCC authors and experts are participating, it spans that whole sp spectrum. Some are official side events to the official negotiations, and others are all of these things that get glommed on really creating energy on the issue. So the countries have been sending in their, um, and it's INDC, and I'm forgetting what that is. Say it again. What it Intended Nationally Determined Contribution. It was the least common sense acronym you could think of. Um, the, the acronyms in reading all the background <laughs> of this, which I, I'm usually, you know, I always deal with acronyms, but boy, the UN seems to outdo everybody else. They do. Uh, let's call these the, the plans that the countries are, are submitting. Um, presumably, they're all in now, and, and people have had a chance to review them, and I'm sure you've taken a look at them. How close are they going to come to the 2C limit? The, the thing that's important to remember about where we are with climate is that and while there's some really bright spots about progress in individual locations, places like California or New England, there are a lot of the ground rules and the legal frameworks that we haven't really test driven yet. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing in the country pledges are really um, a mixture of some very ambitious and some very cautious steps that taken together don't add up to anything close to stabilizing warming below this 2, 3, 2C two goal that we've been talking about. But what they hopefully do 
put in place a framework on which further agreements can build. Mm -hmm. uh, Christiana Figueres, the executive director of the UN Framework Convention, often says what we need is an agreement that's a floor and not a ceiling. Right. And looked at that way, the pledges that have been offered uh, provide a really important starting place. Uh, the challenge moving forward were, will be to uh, build on that in a way that has ambition and energy, not one that says, phew, we got this agreement and yeah. now we can move on to the e next one. Everything's problem. okay. And, and so this is the beginning, not only for the countries, but for the rest of us to keep pressing our governments to um, and, come up with and, an even better plan. And to recognize that the set of solutions isn't going to come solely from this international process. Right. Some of it's going to come from uh, bilateral agreements, like the recent late 2014 agreement between the U.S. and China. Some's going to come from action in individual states or cities or even families and individuals. The, the set of opportunities for contributing to solutions is really vast, and you should think about the U.N. Framework Convention process as laying a foundation and setting some of the parameters, and hopefully it sets parameters that enable these non-state actors rather than restrict them. So um, the, the important thing is that they get an agreement. And the, the term I keep coming across is legally binding. How is it going to be legally binding with 195 countries? <laughs> um, OK, this question of legally binding is really interesting, and especially if you go into the weeds. So, it's very certain, we're highly, highly confident, there will be an international legal agreement that comes out of Paris. It's basically an international treaty. So then the question is, <laughs> there are different ways that nations can join an international treaty. There are a lot of treaties out there where President Obama, by executive action, could join the treaty. There are other treaties that would have so much uh, binding in terms of what US would have to implement and have to demonstrate that Le the legislative branch would have to be the one to join that treaty. Right. So what we're looking at for Paris is probably uh, definitely an international treaty. And it very likely will, will be one that President Obama can join as executive action. That's actually not a bad thing. I think we really see strong fundamentals in place for the emerging treaty. And I think of those uh, strengths really falling into three categories. The first is what we've been describing of the fact that all governments are putting forward pledges. We already have 170 pledges that cover 90% of global emissions. That is an incredi incredibly important precondition wow. for success. And in terms of what is legally binding in the treaty, the treaty will say, yes, governments need to produce these intended nationally determined contributions. There may be a new acronym or several <laughs> new acronyms after Paris next week. Um, the second part is that there needs to be a legally binding framework that enables transparency, which is essentially uh, creating a system of peer pressure in the agreement. So basically, the legally binding part is you need to put a pledge on the table, and then you need to show up and say, here's what we have done or have not done towards our pledge. It's basically understood in the realm of international treaties that creating an effective system of peer pressure is the best way to get compliance. And then the third component that ideally will be legally binding in what is really a required part of steps moving forward is a process for revisiting those country pledges through time and having the opportunity to increase ambition to say okay as the US we promised 26 to 28 percent reduction by 2025 and wow technology prices dropped it actually was easier than we thought and now for the next step in terms of our next five-year pledge we can be a lot more ambitious so and these are all five-year pledges is that well, in the UN system, there'll probably be five-year pledges, but there are lots of opportunities for countries to work with other groups of countries yeah. or for uh, initiatives to bubble up. And what hopefully will happen is that we'll see a real flowering of commitments to solutions where there's a new commitment every week or every day. Yeah. Um, it's, it is important to recognize, though, that there are some fundamental unresolved questions about what will happen in Paris, and many of them involve the issue of fairness and the perception that this is an agreement that treats all countries fairly, that recognizes differences in capacity to implement solution, uh, that recognizes the fact that many of the countries that are most in the crosshairs of impacts for climate change didn't contribute to the problem, right. and also that um, many countries uh, have or will experience impacts of climate changes that have not been prevented by the treaty. There's 
been an ongoing um, tension between, let's call it the developed world and the developing world. Um, I, I think one of the earlier agreements implied something like $100 billion worth of support from industrialized countries per year um, to the lesser industrialized countries in helping them overcome um, their own impacts uh, on climate change. And the uh, poorer countries are saying the richer com countries haven't come up with this money. And is that going to be part of the negotiation? Will there be a, a true international framework to give financial support to the countries that can't afford to uh, convert their industries? Or can't, you know, we, we know that coal is one of the biggest problems and that countries that can't afford to build a nuclear plant are using coal because, simply because it is cheap. How does that play in? Go ahead. So really building from this idea of fairness and the fact that there's broad understanding that the responsibility for responding to climate change should be different across nations depending on their current circumstances, the history of their economic development. That's completely ingrained in the negotiations. It's called context. CBDR. <laughs> <laughs> And that has played out in a variety of different ways. I think the, the pledge in particular that you <coughs> mentioned was in Copenhagen. Yeah. In the Copenhagen Accord, there is a statement that by 2020, <coughs> there would be mobilization of $100 billion per year from developed to developing countries through both public and private means. So ever since then, this $100 billion number has been um, of intense focus. It, it's actually hard to measure the amount of money that is being mobilized through both government pledges but also just private sector investments. In terms of what's on the table, uh, it's inching up, but it's definitely not 100, and billi 100 billion from national governments alone. But part of the Paris approach really has been to engage the diversity of non-state actors, recognizing that if you create a good incentive in structure, business investments can go a long ways towards making the money flow in directions that enable responses. All right. Um, I'd like to get your impression, or first of all, if you could briefly outline what our country's INDC is. Can <laughs> sure. I get that right? Uh, and, and what you think of it. So uh, the US INDC is to decrease emissions by 26 to 28% by 2025 below 2005 levels. And uh, there's a lot of debate about what the baseline should be between countries. Uh, but the US commitment is uh, among the bigger ones we're seeing from countries around the world. It's, it's not as big as the commitment from the European Union, but it also is one that reflects a, a rapid change away from the trajectory that, that we've seen. At least for me, when I look at the INDCs across countries, I try to use the index of, well, how much do you have to change what you did last year in order to comply? And we talked a little bit about the uh, recent agreement between the US and China, where China has agreed to peak its emissions by 2030. And people said, wow, given the rate of emissions growth in China, how can that be ambitious? But if you look at the rate of emissions growth in China and say, how fast do they have to move away from that pathway? to peak by 2030, it's actually even more ambitious than the commitments we're making in the United States. So uh, they're saying, uh, let me just clarify for myself, they're, they're not actually going to roll anything back, but they're going to bend down their, their rate of, of increase at this uh, point. You know, across the global economy, that's what we're talking about doing is bending the curves. If the curve's already had, heading downward, we're going to bend it downward faster yeah. uh, for a curve of emissions that's going up very steep. The and goal is to is to flatten it out, and once you know, once you're you're decreasing, you're bending by a significant amount. That peak is probably only going to be a, a brief thing, and then the emissions will start down after that. The way I view the commitment from the U.S. is that it's serious, it's consequential, and it represents a real commitment to heading in the right direction. It's not where we need to get. Where we need to get is to zero emissions, but if the commitments that the U.S. has outlined in its INDC are followed through, we will be on the pathway 
to at least open doors to the kinds of more serious commitments that are be required in years ahead. And just like Catherine mentioned, treaties and some President Obama can enter into without going to Congress, and some he's got to go to Congress and get Senate approval to accomplish the U.S. plan that's that's been submitted. Um, I, I have to assume he's going to have to go to Congress to get changes to the Clean Air Act and things like that. So in terms of this question of A, what is the pledge, and B, how do we make sure the pledge happens, I think the really interesting thing about the U.S. pledge is that it's on the table now, and it doesn't require any further approval from the Hill. And the reason is that Obama essentially has looked under existing legislation, under existing policies that are popular, what's the most ambitious pledge that could be made. And where is this 26 to 28% by 2025 coming from? It's vehicle standards, appliance standards, clean power plan, looking at electricity generation. And then also it's heading towards uh, the regional infrastructure that we have in the U.S. in terms uh. of policy. And the California system of emission, emissions trading has very ambitious goals associated with it. That is very locked in place. Same for the New England area with Reggie. So piecing together those bits, Obama was able, under executive action, essentially to come up with a pledge for this international negotiations context that has a lot of teeth because it's occurring under existing domestic legislation. Right. Yeah. So he's essentially started on working on the, on the plan, um, but he's got to survive in the courts because, like, the clean power plant one is, is being sued by, I don't know, 20 governors or something like that. So is that where we're at with the, the U.S. INDC? Yeah, it's important to recognize two things. Uh, first, no matter what happens in the context of a U.N. agreement, uh, the U.N. enforcement mechanisms are relatively weak. They're, as Catherine says, mostly associated with peer pressure, who's, who's viewed by their neighboring countries as a good actor and who's kind of a rogue state on the international stage. So the real pressure to comply is um, pressure to be a good citizen in the international community and pressure that comes from within your own society. And some of that pressure comes from from individuals and companies that say, we see opportunities to build great businesses around renewable energy. Um, but some of it comes from the country's laws and the, you know, whether or not the clean power plan stands up to these lawsuits from states and power companies is, is to be determined. Yeah. Uh, but the EPA feels that this is an appropriate interpretation of the Clean Air Act, and there's a good chance that it will enable us to move forward. Uh, most of the states that have filed suit are also taking steps to implement. And so it, it may be that, that, the, that the Clean Power Plan goals get implemented, uh, whether or not we have a Clean Power Plan. All right. Um, I do want to turn to our audience for questions. So again, if you uh, have a question or anything you want to say, please uh, get it. come on up to the mic here. Uh, usually, those who have been here before, you raise your hand and we bring the mic to you. We knew there was going to be a big crowd, so you've got to come to the mic tonight. I'll get to you in one second. But there's one little item I, I wanted to butt, uh, pin down for myself, and, and you referred to it, the baseline. The U.S. plan is to get the 28% reduction uh, as using 2005 as a baseline. If I'm remembering right, the European Union is using 10 years earlier, 1995, as their baseline. Is there a baseline that you <clears throat> think is appropriate, and why isn't there a, a standard baseline? <laughs> or does it really vary that much with each region? So in some ways, it's pretty simple math, no matter what baseline you give, to figure out what the actual equivalency of emissions in a given year is. And you know, if you look across all of the emissions pledges, the ones that give a baseline and a hard reduction target are actually the easiest to quantify. They're yeah. the most transparent. Some of the harder ones are the ones where they're saying, well, here's where we would be going in business as usual, and we're just going to reduce from business as usual by 30%. And there's some flexibility in terms of saying, well, if you end up here, was your business as usual going to be up here, or was it going to be down here? And it's OK that you can work with all of those and actually still have pretty tight error bounds in terms of where we think emissions will be in 2025 and 2030 under existing pledges. OK. Let's get our audience in on this. Speak right into the mic, please. Yes. 
I'd like a comment on whether uh, something I saw was a nice way to interpret what's coming out of these pledges. What I saw that looked nice to me was one curve going way high, and I think that would represent what you referred to as blowing past four degrees C at the end of the century and still building, building even worse. Uh, another curve was the one that meets the two degrees, and it bends over starting, starting now. It flattens out and then bends down. Uh, these are annual gigatons, I guess, of <coughs> carbon dioxide. <coughs> I saw an interpretation by Joe, Joseph Rahm, and I think I, others have, have done it. He was writing from others' views, I believe, which said that these, these promises are enough to keep us still on the one that's curving down toward two degrees. They'll keep us there another, I think, five, ten, fifteen, ten years maybe. What you said, we need more beyond that, and that's what has to come next. Yeah, you know, the, um, the, the real challenge with uh, a business as usual is once we've begun to make progress with emissions reduction, is business as usual going to say, oh, well, uh, the, the U.S. isn't using coal, so now in Brazil, where we have a lot of biofuels, we're going to start using coal. My, my feeling is that we have been overemphasizing the... Um, let's say the resilience or the stickiness of that business as usual and that once we start seeing solutions implemented we're going to see more and more firms and countries uh, recognize that there are opportunities to move away and and the concept of business as usual will start bending over as well and I, I think that in that happens with every other technology transition we've seen worldwide and I think it means that we can make the problem seem harder than it really is. It's a really, really hard problem, but it's not quite so hard as one that's got this super sticky business as usual. Okay, next. So, right up to the mic, please. Talking about super sticky. So um, I'm no expert by any means, but from what I understand, from what I've read of the Trans-Pacific Partnership deal, um, is that they're going to be setting up international uh, tribunals the corporations are going to be setting up their own international tribunals and foreign countries can sue us. It can affect local, state, federal laws, even um, supersede our constitution. And so I guess, I mean, have you discussed anything <laughs> about the TPP, you know, and the dangers that we face as a country and I think globally? Because from what I understand, if we're sued, uh, laws that we have in place right now, safety laws, can be we can be asked to remove them, and we can also be banned from making new laws as far as like renewable energies and things like that. So. Do you want to say anything about that? Uh, neither of us is really an expert on the TPP, the specifics, but but one of the things that we will need and we will clearly need is a way to better align uh, trade policy and climate policy, and there are many aspects of. Um, appropriate steps in climate policy like a, a border-based carbon tariff uh, that are clearly inconsistent with many of the things that have been happening in trade. And uh, it's, it's frustrating that trade negotiations have so far taken very little accounting of the kinds of things we'll need to do in order to have robust, successful climate policies. Right. So so, you know, as a citizen or as a, you know, little me out here just wondering what we can do, you know, to oppose it. I mean, I've signed petitions, made phone calls, written letters, and, you know, it's, it's almost you feel a little bit helpless. Well, as the activist up here, let me make a suggestion for you. <laughs> um, because Peace and Justice Center is going to be very involved in um, dealing with Congress with TPP, which is going to have to um, uh, approve it on a fast track vote, a yes or no vote. Um, we've been dealing with Congress going back to NAFTA over 20 years ago. So I, I've just, I've been talking recently with other people like at the Central Labor Council that are as concerned about this. And we will be having a campaign early in the next year. So if you're not on our email list, again, sign up on the email list before you leave here. Maybe Crystal can start the um, clipboards around. Uh, one of the things you can follow up on about these investor state dispute resolutions, uh, I've started collecting articles now that the text is out, 
analyzing the text of the TPP, and if you go to our website, peaceandjustice.org slash TPP dash analysis, you'll find about 20 articles there already that uh, are really getting into this. So you can start educating yourself, and then we'll be calling on people to, to get active. Um, I've, I've had a lot of meetings personally with Anna Ashu over trade issues. Um, my colleague at the Central Labor Council said she's on the watch list, so um, we're going to be very involved in it. So, Because right. um, what concerns me is you've got all this great stuff that takes so long to get to, and it's such a positive thing, and I feel like, ah, yeah. <laughs> let's just throw a wrench in the works. It's a good question. It, there seems to be a changing attitude in the corporate world that there are, they, they need to get behind supporting uh, climate change um, mitigation. Um, do you see that? I, I know you're into the scientific data, so I don't know if you're comfortable talking about corporate attitudes, but do you see any changes on that? I, we've had all this news about Exxon uh, having known for years and things like that. Um, Last Monday, Catherine and I were in a meeting in Houston with executives from Exxon, Chevron, and BP. Uh -huh. and she can tell you what we learned. Um, I think if you look internally at a lot of the big oil and gas companies, uh, they work with the carbon price. So they're actually in some ways ready for there to be a price on carbon globally. Um, in terms of which oil and gas companies have said on a broader scale in a public way that they would like to see leadership on this issue, we've seen some impressive statements from international, international oil and gas companies with the American companies notably absent. So I think moving forward, the question is, how do we make sure, A, that honest information is the ground rule, that yeah. in terms of um, companies moving forward smartly in their risk management, that they're working with the best available information, which in many cases, most cases, they have. The second one... And sharing it with us, I would hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the challenge with Exxon is actually that the scientists in Exxon have been publishing their science in the scientific literature for decades, and that's an interesting complexity in everything that's been playing yeah. out recently. The second thing is that we really need a level playing field out with the subsidies, in with the carbon price, really putting the incentive structure financially in the right place. And the third thing is we need leadership. Uh, oil and gas companies know how to do carbon capture and storage in terms of the hard part of getting the gases underground. And the question is what makes them uh, feel the incentive, desire the leadership to make sure we can do the scrubbing. That's the harder part right now. They are really good at international complex med mega projects in some of the areas of the world that they're hardest to work in. So I think for oil and gas, it maybe is the business argument that's hardest to make at present, but it's actually one of the most important ones. And if yeah. we can shift that into a leadership mode instead of a call to technologies of the past, the problem becomes a lot easier to solve. Great. And I'm really glad to hear that they were happy to meet with you. Well, we feel that the oil and gas companies particularly are ground zero for progress, yeah. uh, partly because they do have a history of um, foot dragging on the issue, but also because they have the potential to transition from really being the problem to being part of the solution. Let's hope so. Okay, and please come right up to the microphone and speak right into it. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, come even a little um, closer. <laughs> so there seems to be a very clear consensus that if we go past two degrees Celsius warming that we really face catastrophic consequences. There also seems to be a clear consensus on how many gigatons of carbon or carbon dioxide that we can still emit in order to stay below that level. It seems that the science is pretty solid on this. Um, the last IPCC report um, in their projections of meeting this target of staying below two degrees Celsius, they put the goal out at the year 2100. And this time what they did was they allowed a huge overshoot of the actual amount of emissions that we can still emit to stay below. They allowed that to overshoot quite considerably in a number of the scenarios most of the scenarios, and they count on this biosequestration technology to come along the second half of the century to pull it back down so that we can stay below two by the end of the century. This was very concerning to myself and many others. Um, I'm wondering how much this overshoot and reliance on technology that doesn't currently exist is in these negotiations and allowing to um, affect the targets that are being looked at. 
Well, well much vaporware. Yeah, well, well, I mean, nothing we've talked about had any kind of uh, negative emissions uh, technologies to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. What well, we've talked about as a budget and, and allocating it fairly over time. The, when the IPCC talks about these scenarios with n negative emissions, which is the idea that you have some kind of a energy generation technology that um, results in a net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, basically growing trees, burning the trees instead of coal in your power plant, and then burying the CO2. You get energy to your grid, and CO2 comes from the atmosphere into long-term geological storage, like we use for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, we actually do know we can do that. It's done at scale now, at the scale of millions of tons a year. And so it's not new or unproven technology. It's technology that I just don't think is going to get us very far, because the opportunities to commit that much land to the production of the trees that you would be doing with is, is rather um, unlikely. But the, the way this came up is that the economists who are doing these calculations say, well, what's the, what's the cheapest way forward? And, and the cheapest thing is to not change whatever you're doing really, really suddenly. And, and we just know that from a wide range of sources, that it's going to be much easier to solve this problem if we start tomorrow. And it would have been even cheaper if we started yesterday. And so what the, what the economists say is, well, and if you start in a few years, um, you're going to have such a um, headwind that you're traveling against that you're going to have to start doing some exceptional things. And those exceptional things are probably going to be cheap enough that you want to do them anyhow. And that's this biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. Uh, it, it's, it's almost um, a hypothesis in the way it comes out in the models. And, and I don't think that the serious scholars uh, involved in the science or involved in the policy are, are at the stage of saying we're going to have to put a lot of stock in these techniques to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. But that being said, uh, when I look at the potential impacts, I think we may actually want to remove CO2 from the atmosphere at some point. And we ought to at least be looking into the technologies that could be used to do that in a, in a safe way that's not creating other risks in other parts of the Earth system. Is there any uh, promising research along those lines at this point? Well, uh, we do know how to uh, move CO2 from the atmosphere into these long-term geological st stocks. Um, it's, as I said, used extensively in enhanced oil recovery. Actually, it's a great irony. But the reason that we know how to pump CO2 into geological reservoirs is you can use CO2 to scrub oil off of rocks and get more oil out. Now, then you burn that oil and you get more CO2. But that's, a, that's why it's ironic. But, but we know how to do it, and we know how to do it at scale. Uh, there are already uh, power plants that are operating such that the, the CO2 going up the smokestack is, is captured, compressed, and put into a pipeline. And so what we really need is a set of policies in place that push companies to make the investments required to make this technology cheap. Yeah. You know, 20 years ago, nobody thought fracking was going to work. And right now, the same companies that are using fracking every day say, oh, this carbon capture and storage is too expensive for us to deploy. It's because nobody's investing in the research to see how cheap you can make it. Uh, there, there are no technical problems that limit us from doing carbon capture and storage, and deploying it safely at scale. We just need to figure out what the pieces of that deployment pathway are going to look like. Great. Thank you. All right. Right up to the mic, please. OK. Um, so you say cheaper, and that makes me really, really nervous. Because like in the mid-90s, I talked to this guy. And he was all about, we got to get beyond oil. So what he was doing is he was getting bike shops to donate the used bikes that people were bringing back. And then he'd send containers of them to like third world destinations that hadn't been developed yet. Because he figured, you know, if you give them free bikes, they're going to develop around bikes. And then the streets will be two narrows for a car and ha ha Detroit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but then um, around here, it seems work? like the cheapest thing to do is change the name of whatever the problem is, you know, and 
like can, I remember. Can you get this to a question? Because yeah, we're I got running short on time. Three more sentences, and then the question will be very obvious. <laughs> okay. Um, so then, like in the '80s, I remember reading about non-tariff non barriers to trade, and you know the French were the experts on making waiting into a non-barrier tariff to trade. You know, but like here they just changed the name and then they plow ahead with whatever it is they wanted to do on the no new name and my question is um is there anything in this agreement that kind of limits the rate at which language can change its meaning <laughs> i mean i think having done a lot of work with uh, decision makers in this national context where they're coming together in the inter international convening, they're really focused on consistency of language. And I think as a scientist, you, you have this beautiful set of synonyms. And why would you say uh, impact 500 times if you could alternate impact with outcome with consequences? And I would say that they tend to be very persistent in terms of these phrases that become ac acronyms that have lifetimes of forever. Um, I think that's the case across most of the responses. Um, and probably most of the biggest tension points at this point are about finance, technology transfer, uh, improving capabilities for response. And those go way far beyond uh, the definitions and really to the heart of common but differentiated responsibility. But I, but I think the real bottom line is that this is a problem that gets solved by taking CO2 emissions to zero. Mainly, that's going to be done by converting from a fossil fuel based energy system to a wind and solar based energy system and you can change the words all you want but that's what you got to do <laughs> <laughs> and don't make an acronym out of it okay we're running short of time so try to keep your and come right up to the mic thanks for the work you guys do uh, my question is uh, just a couple of weeks ago, oh, I did oh, uh, hear uh, there was some kind of a you know tiny uh, spat between uh, President Hollande and uh, John Kerry. With John Kerry mentioning something about you know this isn't necessarily having to be a legally binding treaty, and Hollande kind of came back at him saying he might have been kind of confused. Um, likewise, I think uh, if President Obama does sign an executive action, and you know lo and behold we're in this treaty, maybe an incoming president can you know just sign an executive action and get us out of. It. And what we don't want is another Kyoto. So my question is, why are you guys so optimistic that this won't be another Kyoto and that the political climate is actually ready for us to maintain this agreement? Good question. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think that the answer has several components. Uh, w one of the components is that most of the pieces of the U.S. commitment to the INDC are already parts of American law. And, and there are parts that are actually popular, things like vehicle emission standards and appliance efficiency standards. But I think an, an even more important component of why I'm optimistic is that I see um, more and more actors across society, states, communities, private companies saying, this is something that we can do and we can be successful with. And uh, for companies, it's even that we can make money with. And as, um, as Catherine described when we were talking about the oil companies, what we need is we need honest information and we need a level playing field. But with those things in place and with creative people pushing to make them happen faster, uh, the pieces of the solution are there in a way that actually gets to be very, very difficult to unravel because I think it's going to, it already has popular support. And the steps we're talking about are likely to increase the level of popular support. I just give one quick follow on. I think it really, really good question. In terms of what's different from Kyoto to now, in terms of the US role, another really key part is that the US did not join Kyoto because China was not part of the agreement in terms of a mitigation pledge. This time around, China and US announced their pledges together. So they're not going to solve the problem. Uh, we can't solve the problem by 2030. But that level of cooperation on the international stage is what we need to get there. That was a really big step forward, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, quickly, please. We're down to the last couple of minutes. I talk about wish lists. Uh, progress to zero emission, greenhouse Closer gas emissions is never fast enough for me. Uh, I heard Mark Jacobson, your colleague at Stanford, talk about his 100% solution that we could scientifically. I know the political will might not be there or the economics might be 
not be in place, but 100% renewable energy is possible to meet all of our needs. I, if you had a wish list going into the Paris conference, what are one or two things that you wish would come out of it, that you hope to see come out of it? You know, we haven't talked about it very much tonight, but one of the things that you need to remember about solving the climate problem is that we, actually, we need fossil fuel. We need coal, we need oil, and we need gas tomorrow. There's no way we can crush the last car, we can hit the off button on the last power plant tomorrow without really uh, not only you know, foreclosing on economic opportunities in Palo Alto, but, but really slashing the prospects for a vibrant economic future in places like India. So we do need to think about a gradual transition, and we need to think about how fast we can bend the curves in a way that not only prevents the worst impacts from, of climate change from occurring, but also protects the legitimate aspects of billions of people around the world. And so in order to do that, what we need to do is we need to get rid of the subsidies on fossil. We need to increase R&D on the renewable technologies that can work. And we need to create an incentive system, a carbon price, that recognizes the damages that are being done by fossil. If we can do those three things, we can put the solutions to this problem on the pace it needs to be on. I'm really sorry. We're, we're out of time. I'm afraid we're not going to get to your question on air. but. Stay right there. We'll get, get you an answer when, when we finish taping. We have one minute left. Have, what's your impression of the state of the political discussion here in the United States? Uh, have, have we won out over the climate deniers, or is it still too powerful? And we've got like 30 seconds left. The U.S. might be the last stronghold internationally of skepticism in uh, the legislative branch. I think that's going to change. It's not going to change tomorrow. But 80% of Americans want to see action on this issue. And I think leaders are going to hear that pretty soon. We always say in our business, if the people lead, the leaders will follow. Chris Field, Catherine Mock, thanks so much for joining us here on Other Voices. It's, it's been a wonderful education. Please give me a hand. Thanks very much.